Uh, finally, again, another question we have to ask ourselves, if high prices will produce a lot more oil, or any more oil at all, um, much more oil significantly, why in the past several years has oil production in countries like Indonesia, Norway, and the UK not only declined, but declined dramatically and continues to do so? Oil prices have doubled and tripled and quadrupled over the past four or five years, and oil production in all these countries continues to decline. So if, if high prices create more oil, you'd think just the opposite would be true, or at least the rate of decline would stop, would, would, uh, would lessen. That's simply not the case. Here's an illustration of the U.S. Uh, situation. Uh, as I mentioned, oil production peaked in 1971. Since then, it's, it's been going down uh, inevitably every year and is projected to continue to decline literally forever. Over these years, we've had tremendous price variations, huge advances in, in technologies, finding, extracting, squeezing oil out of the ground. None of this has changed the U.S. production profile. Uh, at best, technology may slow the rate of decline somewhat, but once an oil well or province or region or country has peaked, uh, it, it declines uh, inevitably, and there's no way you can uh, reverse that. Not to worry, the world will muddle through, right? Wrong. So I think we should be very concerned. Uh, as we said in our first report for the Department of Energy, the problem of, of the peaking of world conventional oil production is unlike any yet faced by modern industrial society. Previous energy transitions that the world experienced, like, uh, such as from wood to coal and coal to oil were gradual and evolutionary. What the world may be facing with respect to peak oil is an imminent energy discontinuity that will be abrupt and painful. The world has yet to grasp, grasp the implications of this. So what happens uh, when uh, world conventional oil production uh, peaks? Again, it's very simple. The dotted line at the top is uh, the world demand for oil, assuming the world economy is growing healthily at 2 or 3 percent a year. World oil production, the, uh, the, the blue line, uh, increases, it uh, levels off, maximizes, it peaks, then it, then it declines, and the difference, uh, for lack of a better word, is, is called a, uh, a shortage. And uh, the shortage gets worse each year in, in terms of what the world needs to continue growing economically as opposed to what uh, uh, the world can produce in terms of uh, oil. As a precursor, uh, remember the 1970s, stagflation, recession, unemployment, astronomically high interest rates, uh, and so forth. Uh, that was a, a mild taste of what we may be looking at over the next several decades. The oil disruptions during the 1970s, early 1980s were short-lived, and they, they were even artificial because it was, it was the withholding of certain supplies from the market. There was no, nowhere, no way that the world was running out of oil. But we're, we're talking about here something a lot different and potentially much more uh, severe. Uh, just a simple chart here shows that even mild oil disruptions have caused most of the U.S. recessions over the past 40 or 50 years. Um, a lot of people say, yeah, not to worry, oil shortages will induce world demand destruction, which will solve the, uh, the problem, from uh, minimal disruption to a recession to depression. Uh, and I love the word demand destruction. It's a great euphemism. Uh, uh, what, what demand destruction means is economic recession, depression, mass unemployment, uh, very high interest rates, social and political uh, dislocation. Uh, sure, that will solve the problem. When the world's economies go into a tank and Australia has an unemployment of 15 or 20 percent, the demand for oil will go down, all of a sudden demand will equal supply. However, I think that demand destruction is, is the problem you're trying to avoid, not the solution. The, the, the objective of policy and of mitigation initiatives should be proactive do something, and then the some things I'll, I'll mention in a minute, to avoid this massive demand destruction. Um, quite frankly, people and their governments uh, will not passively accept massive uh, economic dislocation, uh, disruption, massive unemployment, massive loss of wealth and income. Passively, they will demand that the government uh, do something. So I think the objective should be to use mi various mitigation options on both the demand side and the supply side well in advance to minimize and control demand destruction. Just another energy crisis we're facing? No, wrong. Oil is the lifeblood uh, of the world. It's essential for the transportation sector. For many par important parts of the transportation sector, there's simply no substitute for petroleum. Uh, you, can't, uh, you can't fly airplanes on electricity. Uh, heavy trucks require high-grade fuel and, and so forth. There's no quick fixes for this, and again, it's something that most policymakers simply don't, uh, don't understand. So again, is it an energy crisis? No, it's a liquid fuels crisis. Uh, and, and the world runs on, the world's transportation system runs 95, 98 percent on petroleum. 
I've mentioned several times that it takes decades to address the problem, e even if you're aware of it and start, uh, start immediately. Why? Because energy is inherently very large scale. There's no, no quick fixes, no magic uh, bullets. The only solution is to start early. For example, this table uh, summarizes the characteristics of the U.S. transportation fleet, about 240 million vehicles or so. Um, the good news is that the quality of the automobiles has, has increased a lot in recent years. Uh, median lifetimes are now 16, 17 years for light-duty vehicles and, and uh, automobiles. The bad news is these cars last forever. For example, the Hummer that someone bought last week that gets 10 miles to the gallon, odds are that 20 years from now, somebody somewhere will still be driving that, that vehicle, getting probably seven or eight miles to the gallon. Uh, it, it takes decades to turn over the transportation fleet. So even if you tried to start tomorrow introducing more fuel-efficient vehicles by mandate, it would take 15 to 20 years before you make an appreciable dent in, uh, in the use of, of liquid fuels by the transportation system, not to mention uh, the costs here. These are, are the mean, median costs to replace half of the, uh, the vehicle fleets. If that's not enough to concern you, let me give you this fact. The projections are that by, not, by 2020, there will be no, more motor vehicles in China than the U.S. Just think about that for a minute. Once again, the transportation equipment changes uh, are possible, but they take a long time, and they're extremely expensive. Another issue I want to spend a few minutes on, uh, renewable energy will, will, will save us. Uh, I hear a lot about this, especially in the U.S. Uh, not to worry, we'll just put, put some more money in R&D for windmills or photovoltaics or, or biofuels, and that will solve uh, uh, the problem. Um, there's several, several difficulties with this. First of all, most of the renewable energy uh, uh, options produce at best electricity, they don't, don't address the liquid fuel uh, crisis. So they're, even if they work, they're almost totally irrelevant. The only renewables capable of producing the liquid fuels are your biomass and biodiesel fuels. So this is simply an illustration of the, the U.S. renewable uh, energy situation. Notice that about 95 percent of renewable energy in the U.S. comes from high head hydro, large hydroelectric dams that have been around forever, and the burning of uh, biomass, essentially uh, wood waste in the uh, Paper and uh, paper products and, and logging industry. Only renewable energy technologies that are capable of addressing the um, liquid fuels problem in the U.S. or anywhere else, as far as that can, goes, are things like ethanol, biodiesel, and, and biomass to liquids. The potential for corn-based ethanol in the, U, in the U.S. Uh, will probably max out at the mandated 15 billion gallons by 2015. Even if we can achieve that goal, which, which is, is questionable because the price of corn has already doubled in the U.S., there's in intense resistance now on the pay, uh, part of food processors, hog farmers, cattle, uh, cattle producers, uh, poultry producers, et cetera, it's just, it's just pushing up uh, food prices. But even if you could achieve that, that goal, that maximum goal, that, that physically maximum goal, that would, that would take care of about 2 percent of U.S. gasoline demand in that year, almost in a statistical noise. So I say here that cellulosic ethanol is really the holy grail for renewable fuels uh, production. That's basically the use of wood wastes and, and things like switchgrass and straw uh, to produce liquid fuels. It's extremely difficult, very, still very deep in, in the, uh, the R&D stage. I mean, just think about it for a minute. You're trying to take a, a pile of, of wood waste or wood chips and turn it into high-grade aviation flu, f fuel. Uh, very difficult on, on the face of it. But again, if we, if we don't if we aren't able to commercially produce billions and billions and billions of barrels of cellulosic ethanol, then there's no way that renewable energy can ever appreciate, appreciably contribute to solving the problem. Another question with cellulosic ethanol, the holy grail here, uh, the studies that have been done thus far are indeterminate as to whether it even has a net, uh, net energy uh, output above, uh, above one. Simple fact is that it takes uh, energy to produce energy, I mean, you can see at the bottom there that your biomass options rank very low uh, on, the, on the food chain or on the scale, if you wish. Uh, the simple basic fact is, is that biomass feedstock production is very fossil fuel intensive. Uh, fertilizer for the, uh, the, the, the combines, the farm machinery, the, the, uh, the gathering of it. Also in the production process, uh, the production process is very, very highly energy intensive. Most of the ethanol plants in the U.S. now use uh, natural gas. Unfortunately, the price of natural gas has increased fourfold in recent years, and now many of these plants are uh, using coal to produce ethanol, uh, which has gotten the, the, the attention uh, of a lot of interest groups and policymakers who are suddenly discovering we need a lot of coal to produce ethanol. Even if you took 
all the biomass crops in the U.S. grown for any reason whatsoever. You couldn't come close to, to reaching the, um, the energy that the, the U.S. alone uh, requires. So the bottom line is um, th that it's, it's, it's dangerous to base policy on the commercial viability of, of cellulosic ethanol. Just because it has to work doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it will work. At present, there is exactly one industrial scale cellulosic biomass plant in the world. It's the Iogen plant outside of Ottawa, Canada. It's a small demo plant. You have to scale that up several hundred thousand times, even if it's successful, just to make an appreciable dent uh, in, in the U.S. liquid fuels requirements. So I'm not, I'm not trying to diss uh, renewables here or renewable energy or, or say we shouldn't be investing uh, in them or, 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 or having incentives for them. We obviously should. We shouldn't just not get our, get our hopes up. Uh, again, just because something, uh, something must, ha must work or must have it doesn't mean it will. Government invention uh, is not required. Let the free market uh, take care of it, keep the government out of it, and everything will be fine. Uh, this, I think, is, is, is wrong, simply, simply wrong. The government will be forced to intervene one way or the other, sooner or later, and for better or, or, for, or for worse. Uh, when, the, when the crisis occurs, if the crisis occurs, there will be tr tremendous uh, pressure on the government to, quote, uh, do something. The um, experience of the 1970s and 80s, as we'll see in a, in a minute here, I think gives us some, some indications of appropriate and inappropriate government policies uh, to follow. But, but make no mistake of it, the burden will fall on industry, which of course is of, of concern to everyone in this, uh, this audience. Again, government intervention can have both positive and negative effects. Based on past experience, uh, here are some of the things we think that the government uh, should do to address the problem. Mandating energy efficiency programs, yes. Research and development, yes. Uh, scientific and technical education, uh, demonstration plants, uh, development of strategic energy reserves. Data gathering, especially reliable oil and gas reserve data, is especially important because we simply don't know what's out there in most of the world. Rational tax policies, vehicle fuel efficiency standards, public education is that the problems we face very important. What are the kind of